Good evening, every <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'm Karthik Ramakrishnan, and I'm the executive director of California 100. I'm so happy to be here in the Inland Empire, and it's a homecoming of sorts, not only for me, but one of my fellow directors, our director of engagement, Jesse Melgar. We're also joined here by Alison Burke, uh, who's our director of advanced technology, and we have our two other directors who are watching remotely but wish they could be here today. Before I talk about California 100, let me just say why it's so appropriate that we're launching these reports about our future of economic mobility, our future of education, our future of arts and culture in a city like Riverside, in a region like the Inland Empire. Many of you may know that the city of Riverside builds itself as a city of arts and innovation. That's one of the things you'll hear about today, that we can't think of a California that is innovative and economically strong, resilient and sustainable without thinking about the central role of arts and culture in making that, those hopes a reality in terms of being able to imagine the kind of future we want to build. UC Riverside is also consistently ranked as one of the top research universities in the country that is an engine of economic and social mobility. But Riverside UCR is not unique. We have Cal State San Bernardino. We have various community colleges and private institutions that are creating the innovators of tomorrow. And that's something that California 100 is also about. I'm pleased to note that this month we are opening up our Campus Fellows Program and we have two of our youth organizers here with us today. We met with students and student leaders earlier today and we'll be meeting others down in San Diego tomorrow and we hope to go across the state. We've already met virtually with many leaders in the UC Students Association and CalPERG and the Cal State system and we're just getting started. We're hoping to build a youth movement to design the future of California that will culminate in a summit in spring of next year with the youth takeover in Sacramento, we hope, and with the youth manifesto, in fact, many youth manifestos. We can't talk about the long-term future of California without centering young people, their visions, their dreams for the future. We have young people on our commission. So our, we have a commission of 26, and about half of them are next generation leaders. We see two of them here today that are part of that next generation. Michael Tubbs and Alvin Lee really look. Still <laughs> You're still young, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> We're also gonna hear from world-class researchers and that's been one of the privileges of being the director of California 100, working with our amazing set of directors, but 20 research centers throughout the state. And we'll hear from researchers who have been co-authors on reports that are not your typical policy reports. These are not reports that are looking at the current condition uh, and making recommendations about where we go next. We're not talking about incremental changes, we're talking about big changes for California. And there are two things that are part of our current reality that, that make the work of long-term futures so vital. One is we're hopefully at the tail end of a once in a century pandemic, we hope. But it's precisely the kind of scenario and disruption that many people did not take seriously to think about various systems and how they might be more or less resilient, more or less inclusive as we weathered through that scenario. Another way to think about long-term futures is thinking about justifications for infrastructure investment. When you invest in infrastructure, in many ways, the way we invest in young people, you don't expect that return on investment to materialize right away. We expect those returns to materialize years or even decades into the future. That's something we hope in this moment of concerns and attention about infrastructure nationally and in our state, that we get decision makers to the table, not only in government agencies, but also in philanthropy and in the private sector, to think about the kinds of investments that ensure our long-term success. There's so much more to say, uh, and we'll be hearing from our amazing set of experts, uh, including our researchers, as well as our commissioners today. Um, first, I'm pleased to welcome Lindsay Maple, who is...
Thank you everyone for joining us tonight to discuss the future of arts, culture, and entertainment in California. Our research highlights California's rich, diverse, and expansive artistic and cultural history. The artists in our state are vital to the health and vibrancy of every community. They contribute broadly to our quality of life and contribute in the unique ways that make California a dynamic cultural and economic leader. When most people think about the arts in California, undoubtedly, we think of Hollywood and the film industry, and that's very natural. In fact, the film industry brought in $31 billion in arts value to California in 2020, even amidst COVID-19 shutdowns and production stalls. In 2020 alone, California led the nation in the value of its arts and culture sector, generating $225 billion or more than 7.5% of the state's domestic product. Although this is a minor decline from the sector's uh, contributions in 2019, considering the devastating effects the COVID-19 pandemic had on the employment of artists and cultural workers in the state, um, the sector's value during 2020 demonstrates how critical our arts, cultural, and entertainment industries are to California's continued economic and cultural success. But the arts in California reach far beyond the wealth and glamour of Hollywood. For example, the rich and well-documented connections between arts education and, uh, and the arts create a robust case for supporting arts education funding and policy in every community throughout our state. Low-income students with high arts participa participation have a significantly lower dropout rate and are twice as likely to graduate college as their peers with no arts education access. Arts education instills innovative thinking and creativity in students, which in turn helps them solve problems and adapt to challenges. Also, self-expression through art can help people cope with trauma, grief, and loss. California supports several arts programs for incarcerated individuals and those recently re-entering life after prison. The California Lawyers for the Arts found that participation in these programs improved inmates' abilities to understand their own emotions, feel safe expressing themselves, and communicate effectively, all of which are key factors in rehabilitation. Studies also showed that rates of parole violation for participants were 15% lower um, than non-participants after six months of release. After two years, that difference climbed to more than 30%. Clearly, the arts in California have wide-reaching impacts on education outcomes, rehabilitation, and our ability to make sense of the world around us. But the arts in California are not without their challenges. Because there are so many types of artists, our state's approach, our state's approach to the arts is fragmented. We require dance, music, theater and visual arts in our public schools, but we have not expanded access to media arts and computer graphics design. Of even greater concern, despite these arts program requirements, fewer than half of California's K-12 students have access to any type of arts education in their schools. Despite the explosion of NFTs for selling art, new technologies have also introduced uncertainties for artists, particularly around copyright laws. As the platform economy grows through new technologies, some artists have direct access to market to their consumers, either through Etsy or TikTok, but many others face financial challenges due to the rising cost of living in California. If we do not address these shortcomings, California risks losing so many of the artists that help to make our state beautiful and rich with culture. Because creativity and creative processes have become increasingly valued by businesses, California is full of opportunities to enlist artists to help solve the most pressing issues of the day. As artists are recruited as creative talent into a range of commercial fields, California is shifting from the belief that arts are a discrete, narrow, and separate sector to one that reg uh, recognizes the value of artistic and creative principles, including critical thinking, creative innovation, and visual aesthetics. Shifting our view of the arts from a narrow concept to an expansive framework that allows us to approach challenges creatively is a key path forward for our state's future. Right now, the arts are predominantly supported by private organizations. We see the need for collaborative and robust partnerships among a myriad of actors, government, 
artists, community organizations, schools, nonprofits, private companies, and many others, in order to leverage the transfer transformative powers of the arts into a cohesive and strategic path forward. We generated four distinct scenarios based on whether California wants to see the arts through a broad or a narrow lens, and whether we are able to create these robust partnerships to achieve our vision. I will describe the two extreme scenarios here. The first is a future that sees the arts as a way to provide personal entertainment for personal gain. In this future, we continue to view, view the arts as siloed and discrete forms of entertainment, typically through streaming platforms and Hollywood films. As businesses drive the market for arts, culture, and entertainment in California, artists rely on new technologies to earn a living, but barriers to entry prevent many rural and low-income artists from participating. This future also sees the arts as mainly contributing to the creation of new products and services solely meant to sell and advertise other commodities. Alternatively, the other scenario envisions a future California that provides arts access for all. In this future, California develops robust public, private, and community partnerships to ensure stable and adequate funding for the arts in education and other community arts programs. Public financing enables a broad array of Californians to benefit from the arts um, through therapies, through artist-driven technologies, and creative skill development. With steady funding, K-12 education in California expands its STEM programs into STEAM programs, acknowledging the benefits of the arts in both social-emotional learning and to build critical thinking and innovation skills. The potential downside of this scenario is larger government investment and control, but we saw similar united focuses on the arts during the New Deal's Works Progress Administration, so this future is not without precedent. In fact, more recently, California passed the Creative Workforce Act of 2021 in order to support a pipeline of artists through their education and into creative employment. Cities throughout the state have piloted guaranteed income following the COVID-19 shutdowns to support artists in their communities. The range of artistic media and cultural expression has exploded in both access and content, driven by an increasingly diverse population, the imaginations of young people, and developments in technology. The growing cultural diversity of our state also increases the urgency of addressing issues of equity, access, and representation in the arts. In fact, recognizing the value that artists can bring as thinkers, creators, and problem solvers in generating solutions to the state's most pressing problems requires partnerships across government, communities, and business to ensure the arts are an integral part of California's future. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, and we will come back to Lindsay later when we go into moderated Q&A. Next, I'm pleased to uh, welcome Zach Pardos from Berkeley's Graduate School of Education and uh, co-author on our issue report on the future of education in California. All right, thank you. Um, thank you all for being here and those online. Uh, and thank you to California 100 for uh, funding this research effort. It's been a pleasure. Um, so today I'll offer you uh, two different futures for education in California, uh, plausible with this, within the span of the next 100 years. One in which public education as we understand it today ceases to exist. Uh, and the other in which California's educational system figures out how to leverage its resources to efficiently do more with less. Both scenarios have technology as its core driving factor. And so let me set the, state, the table for these two scenarios uh, by giving a brief history of the relationship between technology and education uh, in California. Now, California is home to the largest public education system and the most storied and vital technology sector in the world. So this will be a very abbreviated history. Um, let's begin with higher education. So despite being home to some of the world's top online learning companies like Udacity, Udemy, uh, and Coursera, California is only middle of the road in terms of adoption of online technology and higher ed. As of 2019, New Hampshire and Arizona lead the nation with the highest adoption rate, 
whereas California has only half the adoption rate um, at 32% of students taking an online course. Now, California's trepidation with respect to online adoption may take its cue from the Higher Education Act of 1992, which restricted federal funds such as Pell Grants to institutions that offered over 50% online courses or over 50% of its students enrolled in distance education. By 2015, most states had effectively eliminated that rule through statutes and regulations, and California flirted with a stronger commitment to online with the 2013 bill that would require online courses be accepted as credit for impacted courses. Um, but that bill was ultimately not advanced. There's good reason for legislators to have gone slow with online. Racial and ethnic disparities are wider in online courses than in person, and completion rates have been lower in online courses than in person. However, we're starting to learn how to do things better online. Online completion rates are now rivaling uh, in-person courses. Now switching to K-12 in California, which has um, early benefited from technology in grade schools. In 1982, then Governor Jerry Brown signed a bill giving a 25% tax credit against the state income tax for computer equipment donated to schools. A California-based company called Apple took advantage of that program, placing computers in 9,000 K-12 schools across the state, and in 1986 brought their Macintosh to colleges. Today, California has 45 fully virtual K-12 schools. During the pandemic, an observation of 18 charter schools found 33 different software packages adopted in K-12. Software from California-based companies were among the most adopted, such as Google Classroom and Khan Academy. So, why might all of this go away? Why is a future where public education ceases to exist even plausible? So take, for example, the increasing partnerships between public institutions and private companies to deliver degree programs. Institutions now partner with a 40 to 50% revenue split um, with such companies. Now, imagine these companies becoming, or these kinds of programs that have a 50% revenue split becoming more widespread or moving into undergraduate education. Currently, they're mostly in graduate education. So why might programs do uh, involve themselves in this kind of partnership? One is divestment from the state in public education as very well documented by Erin Hayes, my collaborator and her team on the education finances section of the report. So this divestment leads to administrative pressure on faculty to bring in money. And faculty therefore uh, partner with these kinds of entities that are good at monetizing educational offerings. Another harbinger is the acquisition of edX by, by for-profit to you. edX was a nonprofit platform developed by Harvard and MIT to deliver online courses to the public um, from partner institutions, uh, but even an organization founded by those deep-pocketed institutions still have to balance um, their books. Uh, and in an effort to do so, recently, edX tried partnering with institutions on what the job market finds most valuable, which is accredited degrees, only to find that 2U had cornered that market uh, already, and 2U acquired edX. So now imagine Google Classroom, which was found in K-12, um, one of the most used uh, education technologies, starts to recommend curriculum. And now finally, imagine that sometime in the next 100 years, automation begins to displace uh, workers. Now, Elon Musk says that will happen approximately two years ago, but imagine that that happens in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, will a degree offerings by public education be most attractive to the many displaced workers, or Will industry have more accessible and affordable offerings, including upskilling and fast credentialing programs? So finally, to close, what is a hedge against this future? What's an alternative? The educational content and instructional resources that the California Community College System alone has at its disposal is unrivaled in the world. Um, but large obstacles still exist, inhibiting students from taking advantage of it all and traversing within the community college system and across the CSU and UC system. 80% of community college students report wanting to transfer to a four-year bachelor's. However, after six years, only 12% have earned a BA. Uh, incomplete articulation or transfer pathways have been partly to blame. So there are some good signs that we're moving towards uh, a more interconnected system of public education. AB 1111 
uh, signed into law last year requiring the 118 institutions in the California Community College system to establish a common course numbering system, essentially streamlining lateral transfer and setting the stage um, for gen ed uh, course articulation between CC and CSU system. So finally, maintaining the California educational system as an economic mobility machine does not mean rejecting technology or partnerships as AI and data will be needed to be used in order to make these alignments um, streamlined, but rather showing technological leadership and agency in the deliberate adoption of technologies and policies that better serve the values of the public good. Thank you, Zach. Uh, finally, I'm thrilled to introduce Mark Duggan, who is not only one of the researchers on the Economic Mobility Report, but is a uh, valued colleague and partner in California 100, uh, which is run both through the University of California and through Stanford University and CEPR. Mark, welcome. Thanks so much, uh, <clears throat> Karthik, and thanks uh, for, to California 100 for supporting the research that I'll talk a little bit about right now, and thanks to all of you for being here. I'm really honored to be a part of this group. A little intimidated to just follow those two very eloquent deliveries, so I'll try to do my, my best here. Uh, so, uh, I, and I also wanna give a shout out to my co-authors, uh, Eric Brynjolfsson, Christy Coe, and Dan Scholler, uh, who worked, uh, we worked as a team on this report. And so I'm just gonna shine the light on a few different parts of this report today. I certainly can't do justice to it in the short amount of time <clears throat> that we have available. I'll just at the start off by saying, in many respects, so I'm an economist. I don't know if that's good or bad. Some, sometimes people cringe when I say that, but I'm an economist and, and uh, I think a lot about numbers. And in many respects, California has for a long time just been absolutely crushing it economically. Uh, we are, you know, we have the headquarters of some of the world's most valuable companies. Uh, employment growth for many years has outpaced that in the rest of the country. And so I think in terms of economically, there is a lot to be happy about. But of course, uh, if you're here, you probably also are aware that inequality in the state, uh, income inequality, Wealth inequality and many other sorts of inequality are high and have been rising now for many years. And this is perhaps many things that if we look out at the world and see what's happening that show this, but you know, one uh, pretty prominent example of late is the just explosion in homelessness in the state of California, which is uh, really something that I think many of us are concerned about and people in our communities are concerned about. And one could argue that in a number of respects, California is losing its, I hesitate to use this word, but mojo a little bit. Uh, uh, and there's perhaps no better symbol of that than the fact that for the first time ever in the state's history, uh, we lost a seat in Congress uh, after the most recent census, uh, which is to say that population is growing more slowly in California than in the rest of the US. And there are many states, and I hear about this all the time in my role, uh, so I head up an institute at Stanford and talk with many people at other universities, not just in California, but around the country, states like Texas and Florida, that proclaim proudly that they're crushing California with respect. If you just look at migration from California to other states, it's accelerated. Uh, and so just against that backdrop, I think that, you know, I think we all understand that affordability is just an incredibly big problem in this state. Uh, and so it, it is just, I just wanna flag that and that is something we certainly talk about in the report. But in the report, we talk about two, there are many factors, the world's complicated, it's hard to distill things into two factors, but we s focus especially on two factors that we think are really gonna influence how things play out economically with respect to uh, mobility and inequality, economic mobility and inequality in the coming years. First is technology, uh, and second is uh, remote work. Uh, and technology, this has been underway for a long time. So the first order driver of income and wealth inequality over the last 40 plus years in the US has been skill bias technological change, which is to say the technologies that are developed and diffused differentially benefit those with high incomes. Um, and that has really led to just an explosion in income and wealth inequality. So one question is, 
is that trend going to continue in the coming years? And if so, what are we as a state going to do about it? Second is something that's somewhat more accelerated more recently is the remote work. Uh, as we've all seen, uh, the COVID pandemic has caused many people to work remotely. In fact, now I don't know, have the exact numbers because they're moving every day, but a very large percentage of the California workforce is working remotely all the time or a significant part of the time. And that actually uh, introduces a vulnerability for the state um, that we talk a lot about in the sense that many people can now work for companies that are headquartered in California, but outside of California. And that is a big potential challenge on the horizon. So in our report, we talk about a number of factors and we drill down on this in a lot more detail. And we talk about a bad scenario in which there's a continuation or even an acceleration of the inequality that we've all witnessed in the country with respect to income and wealth inequality driven by technology where technology amplifies as opposed to attenuates inequality. And simultaneously, remote work becomes increasingly common with more people moving out of state. And I think that has become a more enticing proposition given the affordability challenges in the state and given the, the, the sort of rethinking that many, 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 many companies are doing to how they uh, do their business. And in this bad scenario, we talk a little bit about policies because as we hope that this effort, California 100, and the work that everyone involved in it is doing is gonna help California pursue better policy than they otherwise would. And so we talk a bit about some of the policy options in that scenario. It's how we can attack it as a state to try to be nimble and strategic and try not to just bemoan what's happening to us, but try to um, do our best to uh, tackle it in a way that we're gonna look out for all of our fellow California residents. We also talk about a good scenario in which technology, in contrast to what's been happening for 45 years, attenuates rather than amplifies inequality, and in which uh, remote work, the remote work trend that we've seen slows down as opposed to accelerating. And in, in that scenario, that's a better scenario in many respects for, for, for reasons that we go through in the report, but we also talk about policies there. And I think one thing that we really try to uh, point to in the report is the importance of policies uh, basically being strategic and looking out for the most uh, disadvantaged and helping people realize their potential. Um, and you know that is something that is near and dear to my heart, being strategic with our policies and evidence-based with our policies so that we can continually fine tune policies, not so much in response to what the, which way the political winds are blowing, but more in response to what's working and what isn't working. And this can, this can take the form of incentivizing companies to locate in certain locations. This can take the form of incentivizing the uh, creation of more essential work, uh, more middle income uh, occupations and so forth because this hollowing out that has happened in the California workforce is really a challenge that doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. And I think we as a state need to get smarter with respect to our policy going forward. And we talk, we try to touch on that a bit in the report, but thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Thank you, Mark. And yes, there's a lot in the report uh, and it, it takes, uh, takes a lot to try to distill it to, um, you know, to seven minutes or so. Um, before we go to our discussants, uh, our fellow commissioners, we do have uh, some video remarks from one of our advisors, Josephine Ramirez, who couldn't be here. She was doing her civic duty and is part of a jury trial in LA and could not compete with the traffic out here uh, to the Inland Empire. So if we can queue up Josephine's remarks.
is to um, really lean into the, the, the promise of what that, what that has meant for California. Um, the sense that these are people that come here or live here or stay here. So I'm going to turn to, uh, to Michael Tubbs uh, for the first set of remarks. Michael, we're talking about trying to create a California for all. You've been doing this work in Stockton for a while and now taking your work across the state with a really big, bold goal of ending poverty in California. But I don't think you think of it as that crazy. Um, it should be the natural order of things. How do we create a California for all where, as Mark is saying, and Zach is pointing out, we're tilting in a direction that seems more and more unequal and more and more winner take all rather than California for all? Easy first question, right? Um, <laughs> but first, let me just say thank you, your team, for, your vi for the vision um, in terms of giving us the ability to dream what better or different could look like. And thank you all for, for your research as well. I, What's fascinating to me, particularly in the way this has been structured, is this notion that, yeah, we actually create the future, that nothing is inevitable. Um, so I think to answer your, your question, it's a question of power and agency <laughs> and, and deciding sort of what type of California do we want to live in. But what I appreciate is the report makes it very clear that the choices we make today will impact what tomorrow looks like. And tomorrow's not written yet. There, tomorrow can be written this way or that way or that way, but it'll be written by what we do in the present. So I think for me, the, 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 the call to action, particularly as it pertains to the issues discussed in the reports, is that we have to build the political and the public will to do something. And to the, whether it's the work discussed in the, in the briefs or even the work around in poverty in California, What's fascinating about California, and you, we speak about this all the time, is that on paper at least, there shouldn't be that hard to get a lot of these things done. You have a Democrat who's a governor. You have a Democrat who's a lieutenant governor. You have a Democrat who's a controller. You have, like, everyone's a Democrat. You have an assembly in a state. There's not a divided governing system. So I think the other question is why is it, with that political alignment, are we seeing indicators that the next 100 years of California will be terrible if we don't change course. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a question I'm deeply interested in answering because I think in that answer lies sort of what's necessary to make sure we don't have a California where, where half of public school students aren't exposed to art or don't have access to art. So we don't have a California where um, I think in, in the report market said shanty towns and luxury high rises, and, which is kind of what we have now. Like, go to San Francisco, right? Like, so, yeah, I think it, it, it's really about power, right? If this is what we want for our state, then we have to do something about it. I thank you guys for, that, for, the, for the call to action. Thank you, Michael. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Alvin Lee, who is, uh, I believe, our youngest commissioner um, and who was a co-founder of Gen Up, which, speaking of power, tries to bring student voice in the governance of not just higher education, which is really important, and we focused a lot of that in the report,
but K through 12, uh, and especially high schools, and how high schools are funded and run. Alvin, reactions to uh, the report on the future of education, and more generally in terms of the, the kind of work that you and your colleagues are trying to do to change the future of education in California? Yeah, so first of all, thank you all so much for having me here. Thank you so much, uh, Professor and, and Dr. Hayes, for the uh, incredible uh, report. It was very insightful. Uh, so a bit more background about GenUp. We're California's largest youth-led education advocacy organization. So at its core, we're really aimed at uh, getting more student engagement and youth voice in education governance decisions. And a big part of our work is empowering student board members at the local school district level and also uh, really supporting uh, a special position we have here in California, we have a student member on the California State Board of Education that actually has a full vote, like every single other adult member. Some mm -hmm. would probably argue that's the most influential uh, government position that uh, a youth can probably hold in the United States. So that's very exciting. Um, I think the, the report uh, really nailed spot on on a lot of issues that we're seeing in our education system right now. I think uh, education funding and the volatility of our, our state budgeting process is a big issue. Uh, obviously, two thirds of our, our state revenue streams come from uh, personal income taxes. And for something like education, which at its core is about human capital and the broader development of students uh, as Governor Newsom uses, cradle to career uh, is very important, right? So having that consistent funding stream. Another big part of the report was talking about the need for uh, or, or suggesting the need for a more uh, cohesive system for education governance and administration in California. And I think uh, I, I really echo that point as well. We have a very bureaucratic and clunky system uh, with you know, State Board of Education and Department of Education, County Office of Education, and then uh, local school districts. And sometimes it's not very clear where the authority really lies and so having a, a better uh, policy coordinating body uh, I think is, is really important and uh, I think uh, you know I'm biased because I'm, I'm a student advocate but I think most importantly and what's obviously underlooked when it comes to discussions of education policy is meaningful student engagement and, and student voice in education decisions that affect mm -hmm. us um, I'll give you a great example so uh, in the school district that I went to Fremont Unified uh, mental health uh, is a really big issue the high school I went to was about 85 percent um, Asian and so you know for a long time we had dealt with a string of suicides and the district had done a lot to try to alleviate and address the mental health problem and so uh, recently our, our Gen Up Fremont chapter led a successful uh, campaign where they actually secured uh, 20 million dollars in, in one-time mental health funding to pilot some new mental health initiatives and a lot of these student ideas were uh, youth generated and a central part of that was this idea of uh, bi-literacy cultural parenting workshops right so for a long time you had school counselors and school administrators that were white serving a predominantly student body that were students of color. Uh, and I think there was a huge cultural disconnect. Uh, and when the students came in, they said, look, you know, the traditional approach to mental health sometimes may not be the most effective because when you're dealing with first generation immigrants, right, who may be coming from China, right, where mental health is very much stigmatized, it's very difficult to have that conversation. So the students were suggesting, what if we created these sort of workshops where you know, adults actually from the culture that's being discussed could then communicate with these parents and kind of break through that initial linguistic and cultural barriers. And obviously that's still in the, the testing field, but that's just an example of where student voice can really come in and help pinpoint and nail down some very concrete policy solutions for both not only policymakers and school administrators when it comes to um, in education governance. So I think the bottom line is youth voices is really critical if we really want to make an education system that's equitable and just for all. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, I'm going to toss this question to all, all the researchers uh, and, and maybe to answer it uh, in, in ways that make sense given your ambit of work. Alvin just talked about mental health and especially we're seeing, you know, coming out of the, during the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, mental health was always an issue, but it seems much more severe now um, uh, in, in terms of how it's affecting young people in ways that could scar not only like an entire generation in terms of how they proceed through the labor market as well. Um, maybe I'll start with Lindsay. You know, there was a little bit in, in the, not a decent amount of the report in terms of art as healing, art and its connection to health. But I want to go to, to Mark and Zach as well, uh, you know, in terms of the pandemic and thinking about mental health and resilience and how do we get, you know, if not an entire generation, at least a few cohorts back on track in terms of the, their lifetime earnings and lifetime 
trajectories in terms of human capital. But Lindsay, I don't know if you can take a crack at it. Yeah. Um, so actually, in the arts report, there's a section on um, artistic ar arts programs that are available to military veterans in California. So there's a robust network of folks that provide arts access for folks returned from war, essentially, um, and the impact that those programs have had on veterans' mental health. Um, you know, I'm, I'm like, I can't quote the studies off my head, but um, right, there's just been so much uh, self-reported data that, that illustrates the impact that expressing yourself through, through art um, has to allowing us to process things that have happened and allow us to kind of see the world in the way that it may have changed because of those things that have happened. Um, and so using it from the perspective of veterans and military personnel, um, I think that that would be entirely applicable to opportunities for the way that we engage particularly with young people in schools and through arts education. Um, but I just think that there's this wealth of um, opportunities for us to process through the arts and, and whatever form that takes, right? It doesn't have to be that you're painting, right? It could be music, it could be theater, it could be um, dance. There's all of these opportunities that are rich through the arts. Thanks, Lindsay. Is that? Uh, yeah, two thoughts. Um, one is uh, start early um, when it comes to social emotional learning loss and subject matter learning loss. They're most severe the lower the grades. Um, that's what the scientific reports are showing. Uh, biggest losses in third grade, and then a little less in middle school, high school, and then even less in, mm. in higher ed. So start low, and then also have your interventions be immediate. Um, so another reason why start low is even now, there's early signs that the loss is kind of like compound interest. right? Mm. If, it's, if it exists at third grade and you don't address it, it just gets larger and larger as you go through. Um, the immediacy of the intervention also is a big help. If you wait a semester, if you wait two semesters, it doesn't have nearly the same effect as if you do it immediately. So, you know, flood the zone with ideas we just heard of in terms of counseling and so forth. Um, it's the best thing we could do. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to take, I don't know that we'll ever fully understand the mental health impacts of the pandemic. I think they have hit different ages in different ways, and <clears throat> some people have been more cushioned than others because of their resources, typically. Um, but it's, I mean, I, it's just, it's hard to quantify. We have data about, let's say, how many estimates of how many uh, young people are engaging in self-harm or attempted suicides or what have you, and that's part of the picture, but I think it's gonna be more complicated in how it plays out over a long t longer time period. I think it extends into the adult population as well, um, and I think you know it really was painful for me to see what happened to, let's say, drug overdose deaths during the, uh, during the pandemic, and those really went up uh, a, no a, a huge amount. So I just, I think the, mental health effects on, of this are we're going to be grappling with for a long time, um, completely separate from the economic impacts that tend to be the focus more of, of, you know, of our report and the, the work that I do. But it is, um, and I, I just think every age has been, in fact, to some extent, like our age is probably just about the least affected. So we were about the, um, and it wasn't great for us either. So uh, I think for, for other ages, it was, it was um, for young people especially, it's been brutal. Thanks, Mark. I'm going to mix it up a little bit here because I know some intel. Michael, you're, you're, uh, you, know, you did a UBI pilot in Stockton. You uh, championed mayors for a guaranteed income. From my conversations with Mark, he's not a huge fan of UBI. One of the things I'll lift up is it looks like we're hurtling. I love you, Michael, though. <laughs> <laughs> Want to make that clear. Yeah, 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 no, no, but this is an important, I think, for us to dig into this. One way we can think about not even the long-term economic future for California, but something in the next 10 to 20 years, is this acceleration of a winner-take-all economy and UBI for the rest. Just massive inequality and, and massive redistribution. Is that a desirable future for California? Because we certainly seem to be headed in that way, in which our economic system before redistribution is getting more and more unequal every year but we potentially can paper over it. Maybe this, all we do is UBI and housing construction and then problem solved. Mm -hmm. Like why, why should that not be the solution for economic mobility in California? It, I would argue it has to be part of a solution for California. I don't think it's a panacea by any means, but 
even in, in Mark's report, it talks about automation. It talks about displacement. It talks about sort of, um, particularly for folks who are highly skilled but lowly paid in, 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 in those jobs. So, in, But part of the conversation we're having now in the COVID-19 pandemic made it very clear around sort of guaranteed income is that we live in a time of pandemics. So it's really about building economic resilience. It's really about when the climate catastrophe happens, making sure that folks have enough cash to, to lo move, to locate, or when folks have to quarantine for two weeks, that they have money since they're not gonna get paid for two weeks because too many people don't have paid time off. So really I think a, a guaranteed income or an income floor is really gives us more time to deal with some of the challenges on the horizon. So I view it more as a answer to a present day crisis that makes the crises we're gonna to see tomorrow easier to solve. But I, I shudder to think, and, and again, we saw it with COVID-19 and we saw the federal response when the Republicans were president and when Democrats were president, it was let's send people money. Like we got stimulus checks, child tax credit, unemployment, like folks need cash to, to, to at least a floor. And I think for, particularly in the Golden State, and, and I think Mark's report touches on this as well, this idea of some sort of equity sharing where we all benefit, like some sort of dividend, like whether it's a data dividend or a robot tax or whatever, but some, some way to capture some of the wealth and make sure everyone gets some. So I, I think all those things have to be in play because again, we're, 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 we're mid-air, in my opinion, off the cliff and are trying to course correct now and sort of giving folks a floor at the very least in more ho affordable housing has to be part of the solution. So Mark, over to you. I mean, it seems like um, full employment, even though that might be an economist ideal, um, both with disruptions, but even maybe with the kind of reality worlds we're entering into might no longer be viable the way they were in the past. So just curious about where you think universal income or other solutions could fit in that mix. Right, I mean, California, we, our unemployment rate, our labor market outcomes tend to actually lag those of the rest of the US. Like I looked just before this session and we're, right now we have the fourth highest unemployment rate in the US, that tends to be true. We tend to have a higher unemployment rate than the rest of the country, which is unfortunate. And I think there are things we can do to improve it. Um, <clears throat> so I'm all for a stronger safety net, absolutely. I think that our safety net has really, shrunk over the years and we're doing not as well for the most disadvantaged or to help people, um, to help kids and others from um, with limited resources to realize their potential. So I think we need to strengthen the safety net. I, the UBI, the reason I kind of, uh, UBI frustrates me a little bit is just, it, I think it targets a lot of money to people who don't need it. And that inevitably means less money for the people who really do need it. Um, and so I think there's not a, I think there's only so much um, that we can do. Uh, I, I will just say, I, I, but I think the, the idea, I mean, both I, Michael and I have talked a little bit about this. Uh, I, it's, we're on the same page. We wanna, we wanna lower inequality. We want, I, I would love to end poverty. It, it is appalling to me that California has the nation's highest poverty rate, uh, even though we have so much economic uh, might in the state. It's just really, I mean, when, and that poverty rate is when you adjust for the cost of housing. So we have by far, there's no state that's close to California with respect to its poverty rate. And I think that's really unacceptable. So I think we can do more with the safety net. I just don't, um, UBI isn't my preferred way to do it. I think I, I, I would like it to be more targeted, more in the form of EITC type programs that incentivize work. Obviously there's a whole set of people who are unable to work and you can't forget about them. So I think there are, there are ways, I've done a lot of work on disability programs as well. So I think there's a lot that can be done. I mean, one thing I do wanna flag as we're thinking out is the demographic change that is underway right now in the state. So over the next, the, think of a baby born right now today. When that baby reaches the age of 18, it's gonna be a dramatically different California with respect to the age composition of the population. So the number of people 65 and up is gonna go up 55% over the next 20 years. The number of people under the age of 20, and you can't forecast this perfectly because some of these people aren't, they're obviously not born if we're doing <laughs> forecasting 20 years out, the people who are zero to 19 years old. But the estimates, the best estimates suggest from the California uh, Department of Finance that does the demographic estimates that we're gonna see a 10% reduction in the number of people under age 20 
uh, along with that. So that demographic change, I actually think that's going to create a lot of employment opportunities in the state because there's going to be huge needs for health care. And if we could make our health care sector, which is the biggest sector of California's economy or the U.S. economy, work more efficient and have fewer people doing administration and more people doing care, I think we could it could be a win-win. Mm -hmm. So I just think there's that, I think, it's a challenge, but I think it's also an opportunity for our workforce to deliver uh, better and better quality health care. And it's a, as you know, it's a huge frustration to me that the U.S. spends more, massively more than any country on the planet on health care, 18 percent of GDP. No other country is above 13 percent of GDP. And yet we have the, basically the worst health outcomes of any industrialized country in the world. And there's big opportunities there for us to make that better. And so anyway. Yeah, that would be great to kind of dig deeper into that future health workforce with the mind of changing nature of work. It, what about, I, oh, go ahead. Thing, Mark, Mark, we actually don't disagree. I, I, people say I, I advocate for guaranteed income, which is targeted to folks who need it. In, but I'm happy yeah. to be universal if that's how we get there. But I, I, I think. Okay, we so we're on this. Yeah, on this. That, that'll be good to. Yeah, and that is an important distinction, I think, between guaranteed and universal income. I want to go to Alvin. I mean, Alvin, uh, not just you, but with other leaders in GenUp and just uh, peers uh, that that are in the struggle. No, young people for a while now, but I would say certainly, and not just with the pandemic, but you know the Great Recession, starting perhaps with the Great Recession through today, see a system that either they feel is rigged or really doesn't work for them anymore. And what are the kinds of conversations you're having or hearing from people in terms of the kind of workforce that they're going to enter into, the kind mm -hmm. of housing markets they're going to be entering mm -hmm. into, mm -hmm. and what needs to be done differently? Yeah, so I think there's, you know, obviously with, with, with young people, I think there's a lot of frustration right now at the current political system with the partisanship and, and the gridlock. Um, and, and I think there's, there's a lot of concern, right? I'm uh, a current freshman in college, but uh, folks that I've talked to that are, that are seniors right now and graduating are, are talking about just the ridiculous cost of living. For example, in California, a lot of them uh, want to settle down in California, but they simply can't afford it and they find themselves uh, migrating and moving to, to other states some very random ones, <laughs> for that matter, um, and so <laughs> not just Texas and Florida. No, not just yeah. I mean, someone was uh, <laughs> someone was talking about Vermont. Uh, the other, <laughs> we love Vermont as a state, but it was just it, it's not a very common place that you, that you hear fellow co California college uh, students go to after graduation. So um, I I just think that at least among youth, there is this collective understanding that. You know, for futures, there's a lot of insecurity, and I think there's a lot of desire right now from policymakers uh, to create that better system of security. And I think a lot of that concern and that desire for more expanded, uh, for example, social safety net and, and sort of that future security is what leads to, I think, a, a lot of the the wave of, of progressive energy, right, that you're hearing from students when it comes to things like, um, you know, universal uh, health care, right, or, um, you know, canceling student debt and things like that. And so I think uh, a lot, there, there is concern from students. I think that by itself is also translating into a lot of student engagement. And I guess the, the inverse positive side of that, I think, is now more than ever, at least my generation, is, is very politically and civically engaged. We saw with March for Our Lives. We saw student leaders from Women's March. Uh, the, the, the US youth climate strikes. I think now more than ever, students are really finding themselves engaged and getting involved in that political process and wanting to have a stake and a voice in shaping the future. One of the things you brought up is uh, cancellation of student debt. And Mark, when you and I were talking uh, before this event, we talked about maybe strategic and targeted ways. Here we are in, at UC Riverside. One of the programs, and I think this program still exists, is for medical school students here that take on student debt. If they commit to and ultimately work in the region, then they have you know, partial forgiveness of that debt over time. There are other countries that do this, right, in which they might have their students go to other places, but ultimately incentivize for them to remain. California just kind of presumed we never had to do it because we have great climate, we have a diverse population, a more welcoming state, at least in the last 20 years than it's been in the past. But might we be entering a period in which we need to think about incentives to keep people, like young people in California who were born and raised here, mm -hmm. right, and the kinds of incentives. So I don't know, um, Mark or others, if you have thoughts on that, uh, you know, either in particular regions, like in the Inland Empire or Central Valley, especially in terms of health workforce, you know, that could be a way to 
do multiple things, including thinking about the future of health workforce. But just more generally, like might we see a California that, that needs to do more in terms of strategic programs to, to keep people here? Me or someone else? Anyone, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'm a very strong believer in the power of financial incentives. So I think that, <laughs> uh, I mean, if that is something, and I think whether it's financial incentives for people to stay here and not move out of state when they get a great education at our UC or Cal State or community colleges, uh, I think that's one, or whether it's financial incentives to um, encourage more employment and residents in certain parts of the state. Because obviously some parts of the state are absolutely bursting at the seams, and other parts that's less true. Um, and so I think that I, I think that could make a lot of sense. Um, and the, you know, the devil's in the details on how exactly you structure the financial incentives. It's not something that I would have, th I, I remember hearing many years ago about states like North Dakota that did that because you know, people graduate University of North Dakota, it's actually a great public university, and then basically they would all leave North Dakota trying to get people, mm -hmm. incentivizing people, to, and that, that kind of made sense, North Dakota. California, everybody wants to be in California, but, but at the same time, as you're saying, the cost is, is very high. So I do think uh, policy is targeted um, geographically and for people who are just starting out to help them out could, um, could make a lot of sense. So I'm a very strong believer in the need to be more strategic with our policies. Let me go to Lindsay for a second here. Uh, financial incentives matter, but so too does the sense of belonging and ability to you know, express oneself, the kind of things that uh, our advisor Josephine Ramirez talks about, right? In terms of creativity and imagination and making sure that we continue to foster that. Any um, thoughts or insights, Lindsay, as you've done this research um, to make that kind of a case, right? To, you know, of course, incentives matter. I mean, there's like decades of economics research which show that, but it seems that a state of belonging also matters. I mean, I'd say this for me personally as an immigrant and as a person of color and someone who immigrated to California and to the United States first, somewhere else, and then to California, that sense of belonging, I don't know if you can put a monetary value for it, but it, 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 it keeps a lot of people here because there are many other places in this country, especially now, that seem very hostile to queer people, to immigrants, to people of color, to women. So, I mean, where does the arts play in that in, in terms of creating that sense of belonging? Yeah, there's definitely a huge um, set of community organizations that basically use art as a way to bring different cultures and immigrants and um, I guess like different affinity groups together for the very purpose of engendering a sense of community and a sense of belonging. Um, and, and we have that throughout throughout the state. Um, there are 14 official cultural sites throughout the state, um, cultural community sites, um, and those were developed uh, formally by the state of California in order to help, help different community organizations basically bridge the gap across these different, um, maybe like smaller affinity group organizations. Um, and so that's one way that we've really attempted to create that sense of belonging um, and, and help folks stay here. But I mean, to, to mark, I mean, financial incentives are like number one, right? I did bring up how the cost of living is pricing out artists. Um, and because we do have these new apps and websites and places where folks can sell their art and they don't have to live in California. So they can earn a degree from UC or CSU or community college and they can leave California and they can still, you know, reap the benefits of the community that they built here and then, you know, they, they leave. Um, so what we, we need to figure out a way to keep folks who have built that sense of belonging through whatever that community looks like. Um, and, and help them stay, because I think people want to be, there, be here, and we do have a rich um, cultural heritage and history, uh, so we do have to find a way to keep them. Great. I'm going to go to Zach and then to end with Michael, and I'll have some concluding remarks. Zach, part of your expertise is technology and education. It's kind of, um, even though you talked about a more hopeful future, I don't know, it seemed pretty grim <laughs> in terms of the forces that are pushing towards unbundling, that are pushing towards privatization. You know, what, you know, if you were to advise, you know, either this governor or future governors in terms of 
how we set up our state for long-term success, knowing that a bunch of other states are already well on that journey towards you know, unbundling and privatization. What, what, would you, what would you tell them? Well, first of all, I don't think that um, unbundling is necessarily um, correlated with the privatization. Mm. So, for example, um, the way we describe uh, the unbund uh, unbundled system of higher education is where, let's say, there's much reduced residency requirements, where you could um, uh, attain an associate's degree from seven different institutions taking courses mm. that have easy cross-registration, where you have a single course catalog and like, a really easy way to search it, and maybe a kind of, you know, a, a human and then also a, a kind of technological uh, advisor that can mm. help you navigate that gigantic course catalog, right? So that's kind of unbundled. And, and it's also leveraging the resources of the community college system, right? Now that more co uh, courses are online, why should there ever be an impacted course where someone doesn't graduate on time because they couldn't take mm. it at their institution? We have, you know, um, uh, 116 institutions just at the community college level. So it can be unbundled in that sense. Um, it's just a matter of realizing the resources that the state has, which is bountiful, but they're just not well connected to one another. Thank you. Finally, Michael, I, I um, want to end with you. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your your book, uh, and I just wanted you to, to kind of, there's so much, I mean, I think your own personal journey is also part of California's story, so much struggle, challenge, and yet also promise. I know your story isn't necessarily typical of people who grow up in poverty, but what makes you hopeful, but hopeful with the kind of call to action, right, that it's not just a kind of Pollyannish hope, and, and what, what, sh what should we all be not only hopeful for, but also fighting for uh, in terms of building a California for all? Uh, well, pessimism is such a luxury. Um, being nihilistic is such a, a luxury, and there's folks who are in this room who are like living in many respects, the, the reality described in the reports, but they still wake up every day hopeful that it'll get better and, and still wake up and say, well, it's not for me, at least for my kids. And for me, that gives me a lot of hope because if, 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 if people who are really feeling the brunt of some of the choices that have been made haven't given up, it's like, who am I to give up with access and with um, the ability to at least help or try to influence some of these decisions? Um, and then I'm also hopeful because, it, again, it's about agency, that we, we can make choices, that the good things we enjoy about the state were because people made choices around investing in the public education system, around um, creating a, a welcoming community for, for all the misfits um, and the artists and the creators and LGBTQ, like, those were choices, right? And, 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 What's also interesting about the history of the state is that these choices haven't been linear. You have the state that produced Ronald Reagan and Pete Wilson. That's California. But you also have the state that has that was the site of the resistance during the last administration. So, so I think that makes me hopeful as well, is that California has the ability to course correct, because we have the ability to course correct. And in terms of and then I'll, 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 10, 12 years ago, I was on the Freedom Ride with some of the original Freedom Riders, and we were going to like every place they stopped. And one guy, his name was Bob Singleton, he was a UCLA student. He was 21 years old when he got on the bus. And he said that, he looked at me, he said, I was arrested on August 4th, 1961. Why is that day important? And I said, well, you were arrested. If you weren't arrested, like, we wouldn't have this trip. Like, I, I, I thought he was fishing for a compliment. So I was like, thank you, sir. I'm so thankful. <laughs> um, and then he looked at me, and he said, no, on that day, Barack Obama was born. And then he said he had no idea that the choice he made as a 21-year-old would pave the way for a child born with no opportunity to have the chance to be president 50 years later. And then he said, what are you prepared to do today so that 50 years from now, things look different? I think stories like that give me hope. Like this guy was a 21-year-old college student at a time where this, legally he wasn't a person. He didn't have any rights. Got on a bus not knowing if it would work 
to help desegregate, knowing he was going to get beat up, knowing he could have died. Got arrested. It didn't end with the rainbow. It ended with going to jail on August 4th, 1961. At the same time, there's a young child born named Barack Obama who 50 years later had the chance to be president because of what this person did to, on that day. So that's what gives me hope, is that we, we actually, it's like pebbles in the, in, in the sea. Like it does, the ripple effects are huge, but, but we have to act. And in terms of, just, and I'll shut up after this, but you ask, what should we be fighting for? And I think quite simply, we should be fighting for the California we deserve, right? I, I, like I, I really don't think anything around access to housing, having a little bit of money, kids go to a good school, none of that feels radical to me. I actually think the world we live in now is very radical and, and dystopian in many respects. So that's what we should fight for. We fight for nothing less than what we deserve, to live with dignity, to have opportunity, to not just work ourselves to death, but to enjoy life and, and um, yeah, just fight for what we deserve. Nothing more, nothing less, just what we deserve. Thank you, Michael. I'll end, and we've heard elements of this throughout, and this is something in the work of California 100. When we think about 100 as the next century, by the way, the average person born in California today can expect to live to, to be 100 years, and what, what is the kind of state we're building? That is one of the kind of hooks we have to think about the importance of this work. But there are so many choices either that we make or we don't make that have long-term consequences. We've talked about it in terms of mental health. We've talked about it in terms of scarring of the labor market, et cetera. So that's really powerful. There are two questions that we're starting to use now. We had it in a survey in our advanced tech survey, and I'm starting to use it more and more. And I hope you'll try this on when you think about this later this evening or in, or in, or in the course of the week. One is, what is one small step that we can take that will make a meaningful difference, right? Sometimes it can be so overwhelming to think about the problems that we face and the solutions that we need, but to think about that one small step that you can take, like that pebble or that footstep in that journey. Also think about something that is really, really difficult to do, but is still worth trying. Hmm. And both of those are gonna be so critical for us to build a more inclusive, resilient, innovative, sustainable, and equitable future for California. That's gonna be part of California 100. All of this research is so incredible and so important, but if it sits on a shelf or in someone's downloads folder without you know, young people rising up and saying that this is the future of California they want, and not just young people. We have a commission where intergenerational learning is just so critical. We have a native commissioner who's told us that this kind of long-term intergenerational work has existed well before California. So this is not new mm. stuff. Mm. But we're framing it in new ways because the kinds of challenges we've created for ourselves Good. seem cataclysmic now, not just with climate change, but also with, with uh, economic, uh, growing e economic inequality and also crisis in our governance. So uh, it's, I think the key is, I, I think you, one of the ways you framed it up, Michael, is that we're already living in a kind of dystopia of sorts. So let's start taking those steps. Let's start taking those incremental steps, but also those, those big ideas and bold steps um, to get us to a better place uh, into the future. Thank you, everyone, for your time here. Um, please continue to engage with us. And um, please join us for our reception afterwards uh, uh, to, to talk amongst uh, ourselves and with our researchers and commissioners. Thank you.